LeBron James all the way in. Here comes Simmons the other way. Three on two. Simmons eludes the defender and lays it in with that. Certainly the length altered that shot. Not a good one. Steps. Crutches. Play right there. Orzekas from Jennings. Throw down. A foul. Irving. Oh, splits the defense with the dribble. Yo, what's up, guys? It's your boy Bernie here, and again, guys, we've got another video to discuss, and that's going to be uh, the Hall of Fame class. So if you guys don't know, the candidates came out for the 2018 Hall of Fame class. That includes people like Grant Hill, Chauncey Billups, I believe Rip Hamilton as well, uh, and Ray Allen, along with Steve Nash and Jason Kidd. So a lot of good names that have come out. We also have repeating guys like Chris Webber, and I can't remember who else. There were other people as well, if I look real quick. Uh, Muggsy Bogues, Tim Hardaway, Moncrief, Ben Wallace, a lot of guys that could potentially be in this Hall of Fame class that could be eligible. It just kind of sucks that Ben Wallace is still yet not to get in there. I know Peter has talked about the 2003-2004 uh, Pistons, that championship team that they won against the Lakers. Those Piston teams were really good, and Ben Wallace was one of the catalysts for it. Although he was a little bit more quieter than the other guys, he was still a very good centerpiece in terms of defense, and the dude proved it every year, and I think he is one of the top defenders of all time, in my opinion, and I believe in Peter's opinion as well. Uh, another thing that we should talk about is Ray Allen. I believe, I don't know if Ray Allen's really eligible yet. Uh, he retired in the 2014 season, like, officially, so he might have, like, another year left to wait, but who knows? We'll see where it goes from there, but... I think Ray Allen should be a first class, first ballot Hall of Famer, no questions asked. And I would be curious to see what his uh, induction ceremony speech will be like. I mean, I know I'm a little bit biased towards him because I said before that he's one of my favorite players of all time. You know, even back in his Milwaukee days and even the Supersonic days that people tend to forget that brought him to the Celtics in the first place. But the dude was a beast. He was more than just a three-point shooter. He was also a slasher and driver. But, you know, now that... Later down the years, especially in Boston and in Miami, he was more known for a three-point shooter. Uh, but, you know, and again, just great all-around good players. You also have people like Chauncey Billups, a guy that not a lot of people thought would do anything in terms of, like, a very Hall of Fame-worthy career, and he's proved it wrong by being nominated for a Hall of Fame career and, you know, being selected to so many All-Star games. And I, I just think it's awesome for a guy like Chauncey Billups, you know, seven-time All-Star, and played a key role in the championship just like Ben Wallace did. And then we also have guys like Grant Hill. Granted, he, no pun intended, he also got injured a lot and had a really bad, nasty ankle injury. But he was able to play, you know, 18 seasons on a career-threatening ankle injury and also was a seven-time All-Star and co-rookie of the year with Jason Kidd. Uh, you know, maybe not as strong as the other guys, I would say, but Grant Hill does deserve some props and respect. He was a very good player at Duke as well, so I think he should get into the Hall of Fame, even if it's just, even if it's just his college career. I think he should still get in. We'll see if he's a first ballot Hall of Famer. I don't know if it's going to be the same thing like with what Chris Webber had to do where he wasn't uh, selected as a first ballot, but, I mean, who knows? Maybe he will be a second ballot Hall of Famer. Maybe Chris Webber will join this year and Grant Hill the next year. Who knows? I mean, there's, you know, a lot of candidates. There's 179 eligible. So, I mean, we're going to see what goes on from here. Another player that was also uh, on the, another player that was also nominated. Sorry, as I just read a text. Uh, Rip Hamilton, I know I didn't really say it as much describing him, but, you know, a three-time All-Star and co-starred with Chauncey Bills and that Pistons team. A very great role player. I'll be very curious to see if he does get into the Hall of Fame. I mean, I feel like this may be a little bit controversial, but I feel like he should be in the Hall of Fame. I mean, I know a lot of people probably will say he's not a Hall of Famer with Rip Hamilton, but I think he's a Hall of Famer. He really was a key contributor in that Pistons team that won a championship against a very threatening Lakers team that, you know, was the dynasty to come, but they ended up stopping the dynasty and Shaq ended up leaving that team after that year. So... I would credit everyone that's on that team. So, you know, good for him. I'm just glad that, uh, you know, these guys are getting the recognition. Also, players like Steve Nash and Jason Kidd, you know, ranked second and third in career assists. Uh, those guys are definitely Hall of Fame 
Hall of Famers. There's no question about it. Jason Kidd, Hall of Famer for sure. A guy that, you know, uh, did very well and, you know, won MVP awards and did everything right. I mean, this this guy did everything. And so did Jason and so did Steve Nash. I almost said Jason Kidd twice. But Steve Nash is another player that I think also deserves some props as well. He's just so good at what he does. Uh, very, very, very interested to see if these guys get into the Hall of Fame. Uh, let me really quickly see how many people can get into the Hall you of know, Fame. 12 people at most can get elected into the uh, finalist selection. And I believe you have to get a total of eight votes in order to get into the Hall of Fame. So, you know, if we look back at the guys that I talked about, the, the people that I'm very curious to see who will get like a yes or a no is going to be players like Rip Hamilton, Grant Hill. I think those guys are going to be very, I'm going to be very curious to see if those guys get a yes, like eight yeses. I, I hope they do eventually, but I'm just not sure about this year. I think the people that are for sure first ballot and going in right away, Jason Kidd, Steve Nash, Ray Allen, uh, Chauncey Billups for sure. And it's just the other two that I'm very curious to see. I mean, players I think that could get in this year that weren't in last year, I think Ben Wallace will be one for sure. I think Ben Wallace is one of those players. I don't know how many votes he got last year, but I'm sure it was very close. I'm sure he maybe got like six or seven. He's one of those players that should get in. I, I mean, that dude just played his mind. He, he played out of his mind when he was playing in the NBA. That dude was known for his defense. Uh, you know, he's known in pop culture as well for NBA street games because he was on the cover of one of them, and I believe a couple more. But, you know, he's just a very good player that, you know, we don't really recognize as a great player. He might be one of the worst free throw shooters in NBA history, but to me, he's still a very good player. I think he's one of those guys that I could see uh, should have been a first ballot Hall of Famer, but it just sucks that that's how it has to be, especially because that team wasn't really supposed to win the NBA Finals, and I think because they won the ring, they should get into the Hall of Fame. I think everyone, even Tayshaun Prince, at some point should, but we're going to see what happens from here. I think other players or people that also get nominated was Becky Hammond, which is the Spurs assistant coach. We got uh, also uh, WNBA legends like Katie Smith, Tina Thompson, Teresa Weatherspoon, and then also Baylor's coach, Kim Mulkey, and then former, oh, I guess she was the former Louisiana Tech star. And then we also have Roly Massimino, who coached at Villanova. So, I mean, a lot of guys from the NBA to the WNBA to college hoops, they're all getting nominated for this award, and only 12 of them can go through. I'm just going to be very curious to see, because there's 179 that are eligible. I'm just curious to see who's going to be the top 12 if they do pick 12 and are all those guys going to get yes or no votes i hope that ben wallace does i hope that ray allen does and i hope chauncey billups does for sure along with jason kidd and steve nash those guys should all definitely be yeses for first ballot hall of famer i would would i be surprised if maybe like a steve nash or chauncey billups doesn't get it maybe a little bit maybe steve nash i'll be surprised with chauncey billups i wouldn't be only because Maybe they'll do something where next year they'll have all of the members like uh, Ben Wallace, Chauncey Billups, Rip Hamilton, and then eventually when Tayshaun Prince can get in, I think maybe they'll do those guys, and it'll be kind of like a cool. I, I almost, I'm almost kind of like booking it like a WWE storyline for Hall of Fame ceremony, but I believe that's probably what they probably do. But who knows? We'll see where it goes from there. Uh, like I said, it's a very good list among all those guys. I'm very curious to see how those players will eventually become hall of fame players and we'll see them with their speeches eventually in the future but another thing i wanted to talk about here and this is going to be a combo before i go into power rankings later on and that the power rankings is probably going to be a separate video but i'm just going to do these two uh, discussions and that is the refs meeting with michelle roberts to discuss the tension with the players so if you guys don't know and if you haven't really watched the nba as much there's been a lot of tension between players and nba refs so for example kevin durant's already gotten ejected three times uh we had the sean livingston and i can't i can't remember what the other ref is what his name was but they like headbutted each other you know head to head forehead to forehead just you know trying to beef with each other i just think right now the, the the NBA refs are getting sick and tired of the NBA defending the defending the players' uh, positions and attitudes towards refs in terms of like how they talk to them, and I can understand it from a from a personal feeling. So if you make a foul call, we're all humans, especially 
you know, that's the kind of the the double edged sword of having human error in the basketball game. Because if you don't if you don't have human refs, let's say, you know, you found a way to make, you know, auto calls with like robots or something like that, they will study the rule book and call everything to a T instead of letting players play. And there could be a potential where uh, you know, last second NBA final game seven game on the line, you block a shot, but the, you know, the, the robot ref calls a foul, a shooting foul, and you end up losing the game. I think that's where the refs come in. And that's where I think players should ease a little bit up on the refs. The refs are doing their jobs. They're doing the best they can. It's a very stressful job too, because not only are you getting uh, hammered by the NBA players, the NBA coaches, but you're also getting hammered by the fans. The fans are, you know, ber- berating you. They're cussing at you. They're doing all they can to belittle you as a person because you made a bad call on their team or you made a bad call on their teammate or you made a bad call on their player. I don't think it's fair for them to kind of do that. It's it's just very sleazy and not, not a good look for the NBA if the refs end up striking. Because we don't want replacement refs. We saw what the NFL had to deal with with, with replacement refs. I, I don't want to see that in the NBA at all. It's something that should be not there. I hope that the NBA is able to figure this out. Because if we see refs go on strikes because you know they're tired of this BS attitude from the players, we're going to get really crappy refs and players are even going to get more frustrated. And NBA coaches are going to get even more frustrated with the, with the refs. I just think it's getting to a point where we need to realize that refs are an important part to the game, whether you like them or not. You know, as a coach myself, I can understand when, you know, a ref makes a bad call or they decide to do something very cheesy or sleazy, you get upset. And I do get upset with some of the calls that they make on my players. But at the same time, I have to respect the ref because if I don't respect him, I mean, it could potentially be a point where he could cost me the game or... It's just getting angry for no reason because you can't control what the ref does. Only you can control what you and your players do as a coach. Speaking from a coach perspective, and that's my perspective. But, I mean, it'll be interesting to see if the NBA players, or at least the NBA, can come to an agreement with uh, the NBA refs in terms of, okay, we'll tone it down a bit so you don't look much like a bad guy. And... I just think it just comes down to what I saw from the Golden State Warriors. I mean, I know I'm not crapping on him because I want to crap on him, but, you know, it also comes down to what LeBron does too, and that is just what Kevin Durant said to the ref. He said, fuck you, ref, and I don't like that. I don't like that at all because you don't treat a person like that. It kind of creates a bad atmosphere that a that come, that stems from like an AAU atmosphere to where you talk back to the ref because he made a bad call. Uh, it, it just comes to that kind of perspective and that mentality, which is not something I want to see players do. I mean, as a coach, you tell your players next play, next play. But if NBA players are doing it where they're just yelling at the refs, what's to say that my player can't yell at the refs too? And we've talked to my, I've talked to my players about it and they know about it, that you just can't talk back to the refs because it's just not a good look. You look like a, you look like a crybaby. And I think that's where the play, NBA players need to realize is that, you know, NBA refs, yes, they can be emotional. Yes, they, they have human error to them. But that's just the way it is. You have to understand that refing is the hardest, probably one of the hardest things to do in sports because you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. Like I said, a double-edged sword. Uh, you know, you make the good calls, the, the players and the fans will cheer you. You make the bad calls against their team, they will boo you and cuss you out. I just think... We just need to relax and calm down and come to a reasonable uh, relationship between NBA players and NBA reps. What's not okay to say and what is okay to say. And I hope Adam Silver, being the most progressive commissioner in all of sporting history, can come to an agreement with the NBA refs telling them, okay, this is what we're going to do for you. And I'm, I don't know if they still have it, but I hate the fact that during playoff games, especially last year, they would have a kind of like a ref report where they would say, okay, the ref missed this, this, and this call. I just don't like singling out a ref just because he missed a call. I mean, it happens. It's just, it's almost, I mean, we do it with NBA players at some points. It's like, okay, you missed this pass, this pass, and this pass. You had three turnovers at this key point, at this key point, and at this key point. I mean, we can't just, you know, critique little, little, little because, you know, it doesn't lead to something. I mean, it just leads to just, pettiness 
st- stupid stuff to argue about. It makes no sense to argue about it. Let the NBA refs, you know, be free to make a call because if you end up saying, okay, you made a mistake here, here, and here, he's going to probably tighten up a little bit more with the whistle and probably not call a foul that's a blatant foul because he's afraid that he's going to get on the on the report, on the ref report, that, hey, you missed a call or, hey, you fouled him when he wasn't supposed to be fouled. I just think that we need to calm down and just relax and ease up on the refs. I mean, these guys are doing a hard job as it is, you know, dealing with fans, dealing with players. So I think NBA players need to kind of cut some slack on this. I hope that NBA players are able to do that for the refs, and I hope that the refs are able to come to an agreement as well as to what's okay to have a discussion with an NBA player or a coach and what's not okay to have a discussion with. The NBA ref says, look, you fouled him because you did this, this, and this. You didn't stay straight up. You went and reached over. I think if the ref did, you know, did it like that, instead of the ref going, no, don't argue with me, next call. I think the refs and the NBA players need to have a better relationship with one another because it'll make the sport better and it'll also kind of create a better atmosphere that also incentivizes not for uh, players to kind of berate the refs like what we saw with a Kevin Durant or a Sean Livingston or hell, even like what DeMarcus Cousins does sometimes or even what Anthony Davis did by chasing down the ref. It just it just looks stupid. It looks corny and it looks silly. You players need to realize that fouls, fouls called and fouls not called are going to happen. It happens in the game. Especially, you know, stuff like what Steph Curry did by throwing a mouthpiece. I mean, that just looks childish. I think you're above throwing a mouthpiece at players or even a mouthpiece at a ref. You just, we just need to calm down and just realize that, look, these guys are doing a hard job as it is. And you should realize that if you were in the same position, you would not want to be belittled, berated by someone that you are doing a job for. So let's come to an agreement, both the NBA players and the NBA refs, along with the commissioner, and just, you know, have it ease tension because I don't want to see replacement refs if that's what it's going to lead to because it, it just doesn't, it's not good for the game and it's not good for players because they'll get even more upset along with the coaches as well. They'll get more upset, they'll get more angry, and I hope we just don't have to deal with that. But anyway, guys, this is uh, all I have to say for this section of the, of the ugh, I almost called it the gimmick cast, sorry. We're not doing a gimmick cast this week. I'm very sorry, guys, but what I meant to say is this is the, what I have to say about the charge. This is the first segment of the charge. The second segment will go up on Saturday, and that is going to be talking about the NBA power rankings. I know we didn't talk about it all this week, but we're going to talk about it this week. We're going to see who's number one, who's number two, and who is uh, the where are the New York Knicks going to fit in, especially after today's game. Uh, you know, a little salty, Peter. I'll, I'll say that I'm a little salty that the Knicks won, but. Good to see that it was a good rivalry game. I'm glad that Michael Beasley is balling out. But anyway, guys, this has been your boy, Bernie. I'll see you guys in the next episode. Peace. Peace.